Well, hello everyone. Uh, as I had mentioned, I wanted to put together a lecture that basically looks at our very last chapter, which is social psychology. I uh, don't have a, a video of yours truly running right now, but uh, obviously pay attention to the slides, pay attention to uh, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, should work just as fine. Here we go. Social psychology is really different from any other chapter we have covered the entire semester because social psychology basically studies not the individual. Everything up to this point has looked at the individual uh, and, and their ability to remember, their ability to learn, their ability to, uh, uh, you know, states of consciousness, to be motivated and so on. But now we talk about behavior in terms of group behavior. So that's what I want to talk about groups and how the individual can affect a group and how the group can basically turn around and affect the individual. To begin with, I want to give you a definition of what a group is. So please make sure you write this down. Uh, the definition of a group is quite simple. Uh, a group is two or more people working together towards a common goal. That's the definition of a group. Two or more people working together towards a common goal. Okay. Now that common goal may be to uh, study for a, uh, for an upcoming test. That uh, common goal can be to work to start a summer business. That uh, common goal can be to uh, get on the bus uh, down at the street corner and uh, these two, three, four people ride it about two miles and get off at another street corner. That's a group of people, all right? Groups can be very, very powerful, especially when they mean an awful lot to us, okay? Uh, the effects of groups are very, very strong, uh, especially if that is a group we want to be a part of. If it's just people gathered together, the influence of the group is not as strong as a group of people brought together who are friends, who are colleagues, who mean a lot to one another, and who are working towards a very important goal, the importance of the goal affects the, uh, the influence of the group. Now, to talk about the power of groups, I want to turn around and mention what are called reference groups. Reference groups are groups that you look up to, groups that you want to be a part of, all right? Groups that you hold in very high regard. Um, if you want to get into the world of nursing, if you want to get into the world of business, if you want to be an accountant, those are just three examples right there of groups that might be very powerful and you might do the things that they do and wear what they wear and so on. Even if you turn around and want to join a sorority or a fraternity, you know, that is a group that may mean a lot to you and you want to be part of a particular uh, uh, fraternity or sorority and you're willing to lay down the money and so on. Okay. So many different types of groups and if they mean a lot, they can be very influential. So there's my definition there. I apologize for not putting that up a moment ago, but a reference group is a group that we really want to be a part of, all right? Now, some groups are very formal. The formal reference groups are groups that have rules, they have guidelines, they may have annual dues that you have to pay to be part of them. You might hear your, your mom or dad are part of a rotary and you go, what's a rotary? Well, that's a group of businessmen and women that might gather monthly or quarterly and they have to pay to be part of that. And uh, they, they, you know, talk with each other, they market what they're doing, they might listen to a speaker, uh, you know, that, that can be a reference group, that, that can be a formal group. Even as I just said, fraternities and sororities can be uh, formal groups because they have bylaws, they have rules, you have to pay your dues to be a part of them, you know, any group that you hold in high regard that has a kind of set, strict way of doing things, you know, to be a part of us, you have to do this. If you want to be a, a nurse, you have to pass exams. If you want to be a lawyer, you have to pass the bar. You know, those are all formal groups. But there are also informal groups. And informal groups are just the opposite. They they may mean a lot to us, but they may not have any kind of rules or guidelines or annual dues to be a part of. Uh, it's amazing how people will go to um, Sturgis, South Dakota during the summer and they ride their motorcycles up there. And uh, what do they do? They uh, turn around and, and we'll see lots of tents, 
that pop up on the side of the road, selling uh, accessories for your bike, selling clothing, uh, selling uh, even tattoos and things of that sort. And people will pay good money to be part of that. Uh, there's what's called the College World Series. This is for baseball. Uh, the women play in, uh, I believe it's the end of May in Oklahoma City, and the men play in June in Omaha, Nebraska. And my wife is from Omaha, and I know that during the College World Series, about 12 teams make it, uh, maybe less. And basically, there are people going to all the tents and vendors, buying everything they can to associate with their team. All right? So very informal. But people will pay good money to be like that. So the question then becomes, what will we do to be like a group? Okay, what will we do to be part of a group? We're now going to get into some topics related to that. So let's talk about this a little bit. The first term I want to talk about is called de-individuation. And that's not misspelled. I've been accused of misspelling that, de-individualization. No, de-individuation. The idea behind de-individuation is this. It's a phenomenon where we will actually see people carry out behavior when they're in a group that they would never do if they were by themselves, okay? The individual who is at a concert and turns around and uh, throws something up on stage, I actually saw that once. Through someone in, at a concert threw a beer bottle up on stage, uh, shattered into two dozen pieces. The guitarist looks out at the crowd, and the crowd is so huge, you can't figure out who threw it, all right? Um, you find yourself in a large group, you might say something from within the group, a, a, a caustic remark or a, a, an off-color comment because you can be part of the group, you can hide in the group. You might not ever do that if you're the only person uh, in the room other than the person you're talking to. You might not do that if you're the only person on the floor at a concert and then the band is up there, all right? People will do things in a group they would never do alone, all right? Why, why is that? Why do people carry on that way? And the answer is the group doesn't offer security. They're not going to protect you necessarily, but you can remain anonymous. And that's what the individuation is about. We see behavior that people would never do otherwise because they can remain anonymous. Now, there are different facets of the individuation. And I want to mention a few of these. The first type of de individuation is to de individuate based off group size. If you look at the picture there on the left, that is a picture from Mardi Gras in New Orleans, typically in the month of February, where people show up and they have a big, big party, uh, you know, called Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. And there is always a problem with pickpockets. And as I understand it, people will turn around and uh, come up from behind. I mean, it's just a mass of people, as you see, they're slowly walking down the road and somebody will grab your purse First, somebody bumps into you. Then another person grabs your purse or grabs your wallet. You might feel it start to disappear, but as soon as they grab it, they hand it to a third person that's standing behind them, okay? So you might, you know, spin around and look at this person face to face and they're like giving you a look of shock. Why, what's the problem? You took my purse, you took my wallet. I don't have it. Well, actually they handed it off to somebody. Your purse is about, oh, six inches away you know, a foot away, but chances are you're never going to see it again because this is all done when you're surrounded by a thousand people. An individual or these individuals would never try that if you're the only person on the street and the three come up to one bump into you, two grab your purse, and three take it from the person who grabbed it. They would never try that if it's an empty street late at night because then you know it's that. So one of the things that uh, reasons that people will be individuate is based on group size. They can remain anonymous in a big group. The second reason is technology. You see there, you know, the all on the phone. I have heard and seen people treat telemarketers on the phone by saying some of the most vile and rude and cruel things. Because if it gets to be a problem, you simply hang up the phone. That's no big deal. You simply hang up the phone and you're done, all right? People driving down the road, their technology is their car. They turn around uh, and they yell and scream at the car next to them. They berate them. They use bad language. 
uh, you know, give them a particular finger. But if things get tense, you just press the accelerator and drive away. All right. And one of the worst examples of de-individuation in a group and remaining anonymous is uh, really the internet. I've seen people post things on social media, post things on articles and essays that individuals write that are just downright nasty and rude, you know? I, I, I kid you not when I've seen a person uh, post something such, I, I hope you die. I mean, my God, if I were around you, the things I would do, it would be horrible. But they would never say that to a person's face. They would never say that to their face. They are posting this from their phone or their laptop from a thousand miles away, you know? And because of that, they can remain anonymous. And because of that anonymity, they don't have a problem doing what they do. It's all examples of the individuation. Now, the last one uh, uh, where we see the individuation is uniforms, okay? Where people turn around and they hide behind uniforms. Now, I'm not picking on the military by the picture I put up there, but uh, here in Southern Missouri, we have Fort Leonard Wood up the road. And many, many years ago, it's gotten much better. But many, many years ago, if people from the, uh, the military base, say, wearing their camos, went to a local bar, sometimes the locals didn't get along with the people from the base. Sometimes there would be a fight. Something would break down at the bar. The police are called, the county sheriff shows up, you hear the siren, and everyone scatters. The bartender is asked, who did it? Well, it was two or three or four people from that base. Well, what were they wearing? What were their names? I don't know. They were all wearing that camouflage stuff. We call that a BEU, a battle dress uniform. They're wearing that camouflage stuff. And the county sheriff goes, well, that narrows it down to 15,000 people. You know, you've got to tell me more than that, okay? Individuals who turn around and wear masks, individuals who turn around and, and you know, hide their face, uh, but they'll get in front of the camera, you know, and things of that sort. Uh, those are examples of being able to be anonymous, and people will do things if they can remain anonymous that they would never do otherwise. Different forms of the individuation. And then there's a term called conformity. What do I mean by conformity? Imagine driving down the road trying to get to, to work. Okay, imagine that you're doing the speed limit, let's just say, for example, 40 miles an hour, and you're driving to work, and the road that you're on, 40 mile an hour speed limit, you're doing 40, and uh, it's a wide open strip. There are no street lights close by, everything's fine, but you're catching up with a car up ahead. So what do you do? You change lanes. You start to go around them. And what do they sometimes do as you start to pass them? They speed up, all right? They speed up. Suddenly they're going as fast as you, and instead of doing 40 and passing a car that a moment ago was doing 30 or 35, now you've got to kick it up to 50 just to get around them. They are conforming. Conformity is matching one's behavior to that of another. Okay? Matching one's behavior to that of another. And a lot of people, you know, they accelerate. I don't think they even know they're doing it. They just match their behavior to yours before they realize that they too are up to 50 miles an hour. And then sometimes they slow down and sometimes they don't. Not all conformity is bad, okay? Some people actually get very upset. They, they try to tell me I don't conform, I'm not a conformist, but not all conformity is bad. It really truly isn't, all right? But let me give you an example of conformity that a lot of people don't wanna talk about because they don't think they conform and here's an example of it. That's right, fashion. I see men and women both turn around and wear certain styles of clothing, certain attire. I remember in times gone by when body jewelry was the end thing, or tattoos were the end thing, you know, and, and, and people wear certain styles of clothing, uh, certain hairstyles, uh, you know, men are not shaving because the rugged look is in, women are wearing boots because that's in, you know. Some people are offended because they consider themselves a nonconformist, but they go to a lot of trouble to dress like everyone else does. Guess what? Fashion is a fantastic example, sometimes of millions of people conforming. So just how far will we go to conform? This is a very interesting question. How far would we go to conform? Imagine that you are part of an experiment. You are one 
of uh, six people, okay, or seven people, let's say, that have been uh, asked to volunteer for an experiment. And in this experiment, you're told it is a study on visual acuity, visual acuity, okay? That's no big deal. So what happens? The uh, person running the experiment, you're in a room with six other people, seven of you total, and the researcher starts showing you pictures like you see here, exhibit one, and asking you questions like, which of the three choices is most like exhibit one, A, B, or C? And in the beginning, everyone is getting them right, okay? Everyone is asked and everyone says the same answer. It's all correct. You're thinking to yourself, I'm going to turn around and, and get some bonus points for doing this. It's really no big deal. And then something odd happens. You get to a question, show a picture like you see here. And let's say that people turn around and they choose B. And person number two chooses B. And person three and four and five all look and look and say B. And it comes to you, you're person number six, all right? Everyone's chosen the wrong one. What are you going to do? A gentleman by the name of Solomon Ash, A-S-C-H, A-S-C-H, Solomon Ash, did a study just like I'm describing. And he had seven subjects. Six of them were what we call confederates. Confederates, they were in on it. They knew what was going on. So they knew how to act and knew how to carry on. When the time was right, they all started missing the questions. If you look at the people there in that photo there from left to right, all right, the person that was the actual subject was seating in chair number six. That's the gentleman with the glasses uh, and the white shirt and what looks like a tie way off to the right. You have the researcher holding up the cards, the gentleman seven there looking off. But six is staring long. He's trying to figure out how it could possibly be B. In this study on conformity, 70% of the subjects sided with the group's wrong judgment at least one time. 70% went with the group's wrong judgment at least once. They conformed. 30% of them never did. But the 30% who were later interviewed asked, did it make you feel uncomfortable? And a lot of them said yes. It was uncomfortable to go against the group. The desire to conform is quite strong. And you might look at those lines and say, well, I would never do that. But ask yourself this. Have you ever gone out with friends on a Friday or Saturday night and someone turns around and comes up with an idea? Hey, this is what we should do. And you're sitting there thinking to yourself, this is a bad idea. This is not a good idea. All right. Did you speak up and say something, or did you sit quietly and join the group? You have to ask yourself, did you conform? I'll be honest with you. In my younger days, I sat there quietly and didn't say a word. The power to conform is so strong. Here's the kicker. The power to conform is so strong, we will sometimes go against what we know to be right just to be part of the group. We'll go against what we know to be right just to be part of the group. That's how powerful conformity can be. One last thing. As you look at those seven people, Ash did a second phase to the study where he turned around and began again and in the, with a, a whole different group, uh, six confederates, but a different uh, seven, yeah, six confederates, seven total, and then the one person who was the actual subject, okay, sitting in chair number six. In the revised study, when it got to the point that the group started to miss it, person one, two, and three all chose the wrong answer. Person four broke from the group. Person five went with the wrong answer. What do you think person six did? Person six now has an ally. Someone has already said they disagree. Solomon Ash found in his study that if, if at least one person broke from the confirmation, okay, just one, the odds of somebody else, the true subject, refusing to conform went up dramatically, okay? If just one person refuses to conform, the odds of everyone else doing the same or, or, or the actual subject doing the same goes up a lot. Why do I tell you this? If you're ever out with friends, you're ever in a group, and someone suggests something that 
you think is a bad idea. Instead of just giving in, I dare you, I challenge you, I want you to dare to say, you know what, I don't think this is a good idea. You know what, I'm not sold on this. This is a bad idea. Because you might be surprised that somebody else in the group speaks up and says, I agree with so-and-so, you know. You're just waiting for someone to voice their opinion. And if you can be that voice, sometimes that's what it takes to make a difference. The power of conformity. The last thing I want to mention here is the concept of when conformity goes wrong. And sometimes this has happened. There is a term out there called group think. Group think is a phenomenon whereupon people in a group conform with a very powerful leader. Someone is perceived to be a strong leader. Someone is perceived to be a trusted leader. And what happens? People turn around and agree with that leader, even though they think their decision is not a good one. This has happened in different situations. I don't know if you've ever turned around and been down to Branson, Missouri, and been to the Titanic exhibit. It's a fantastic exhibit. I really do like it. But that is, unfortunately, a very good example of conformity, okay? The man who built the boat, talking back in, what, 1912, all right? Bruce J. Ismay wanted to set a speed record across the Atlantic on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. Captain Smith, at the time, thought that was a bad idea. He pointed out, it's, there's no moon, it's dark, there are icebergs in the area, going full speed is a very bad idea, we shouldn't do it. Bruce J. Ismay turned around and said, this ship is basically unsinkable, don't worry about it. Ismay was the founder, he was the creator of this boat, he built this boat, and Smith just agreed with him. He agreed with a powerful person and over 1,400 people lost their lives. The uh, shuttle challenger example is another uh, uh, type of uh, conformity group thing, where basically uh, for a space shuttle uh, back in the days to take off and go into the heavens, you had a series of uh, engineers that had to give their okay. If just one engineer said it's a bad idea, no go, all right, on the day of the, uh, the launch, then it was, it was basically put on hold. The Space Shuttle Challenger, all right, had been on hold for two times. It had been delayed prior. But on the day that it was to take off, that engineer who was in charge of the big gas tank connected to the outside thought it was a bad idea. But he was pressured by the people in charge. And so when they asked everybody, okay, are we a go or no go? He had actually stopped it two days before. This time he said, we are a go, all right? He conformed with the group. And some 90 plus seconds after takeoff, the ch uh, shuttle Challenger blew up on live television. I believe it was six uh, astronauts lost their lives. Conformity is more than just a topic in a video. The power of conformity is quite intense and people have lost their lives because of it, all right? That's enough for now. Take care.